Good morning. I'll be reading Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 17. And it's the New American Standard is what I go with. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Thank you, Kevin. I had to throw all those big words at you. It's good to see you guys this morning. Lots of great things going on here. Uh, so many things that are happening here lately. Uh, later on, you're going to get to hear about the El Salvador report, and Curtis is going to share a few slides with you. Uh, I do need to let you know I'll be gone next Sunday. I am not trying out anywhere else, so don't give my job away. Uh, but we are actually going to Orlando, and I'm going and so that my wife can preach. She is the speaker at the Equip Conference, which is held in Orlando, and so she has three sessions she's going to be giving there, and it just right, happens to be right next to True at our grandson, so, oh, and his parents. <laughs> so we'll get to see them, and that'll be a great time to be able to do things like that. Uh, you'll notice in your bulletin when you get it out, not now, that uh, there's a list for backpacks. We're going to be doing that again this year for the schools and just being able to make an inroad into the schools and into some of the teachers and so that we have a presence in the community and a place to be able to do some things like that. And so hopefully you'll be able to respond to that and we'll be able to do what we did last year again. I know we had teachers who were very, very impressed with us and schools calling us and saying thank you so much. And so... That's always a good thing. All right, one more. We've been trying to talk about updating our auditorium. Uh, we did our village upstairs a few weeks ago, a few weeks, a few years ago. And so we're talking about updating our auditorium and trying to get some ideas on that. And so I'm going to give you just a little brief summary of what that might look like. This is called carpet. Just in case you didn't know, but that's kind of the one we've kind of agreed on. It's not a lot different from what we have, but it might give us some kind of an idea of, of what things are going to look like. They're going to expand the stage so that I don't fall off and kill myself here, because <laughs> I don't know if you realize, but I've only got one step. This is it, and the next step is on the floor, which I'm sure you would like, but uh, <laughs> it might be easier to move around here if if things were a little bit larger and when we have things like LTC performance and mission teams who are going away we can fit more people here and we can actually do some activities and some things like you know having groups and having plays and having some things that happen here where more than one person can stand up here at a time and so I think that's going to be good for for the new auditorium this is just a sample. Maybe there are some uh, tile 
things that are 3D, and we talked about maybe putting those. You can kind of see the stage expanded in the photo, take out the rest of this stuff and make it a little bit more open, a little bit bigger. Uh, not, that's probably not going to look like that on the walls exactly, so we're still talking about that. Uh, there's a little bit more of it. We're going to recover pews. Talked about chairs, but I think we're at pews right now and just recovering pews. I don't know that they'll be blue, but that's the only color I could get to work on here. <laughs> so we talked about lighting in here as well, and we met with a guy who is an expert on lighting, and he said, you need to do a better job with your lighting because your colors aren't showing up here. And so... Some of us were talking about painting walls, and he said, well, I think you'd be okay with walls if you just had light that would show what the colors are. And so we're going to be redoing some of the lighting as well. Uh, we put one bright one at the back in case you hadn't noticed it yet. But it'll be LEDs and, and recessed lighting and things like that. And so possibly looking at some things along there that will make a difference in here. There's with gray walls instead of brick color walls that we have now. But I think it's more the, the lighting that will give you a different feel for some of those kind of things. Different color panels. They make all kinds of this stuff. But we're still deciding, picking, figuring things out. But I want you to know that this is on the horizon and things will look different in here a little bit. So the passage that was read to us in Acts chapter 2. I think it's one of those amazing times where it finally all comes together. It's been a long trip. And it's been a really long time with them all being able to be trained by Jesus, following Jesus, doing all the things that Jesus wants them to do, being sent out to preach, being able to do miracles, being able to cast out demons, being able to do all this stuff as they are following Jesus. And then he starts talking to them about death. And then Jesus dies, and he's buried, and he's raised. And what an exciting time it is, and they're all kind of sitting there and saying, what next? And so the beginning of Acts chapter 2 is when the Spirit falls on them, and they are able to speak in other tongues. And this passage is where you see some other people coming together. 13 or 14 different places it talks about. And then so as you look at all these different things that are going on with this spirit and the sound like a hurricane, that rushing mighty wind, if you've ever been in a hurricane, you understand that that, that is powerful. Sounds like a train coming right straight at you. No wonder people came together after something like that. I mean, when you hear something like that, it's just amazing. And of course, then not many of us have to overcome that the song leader is drunk. You know, we think maybe these guys are crazy. Well, Jacob, I'm not sure. But usually you don't have to overcome that first and say, you know, everybody else up here isn't. He says this is what was prophesied by Joel and goes on to explain some of the things about Joel and about this, but there's one phrase I want you to notice. It's in verse 14. Peter standing with the eleven. What does he mean, Peter standing with the 11? Is everybody else laying down? Were there seats all over the city streets out there? Everybody's standing. What does he mean, Peter standing with the 11? Well, there's 11 men who got up to speak. There's 12 men who got up to speak, I guess. And so Peter standing with the 11 is able to say, here's what this is all about. I'm not sure they had always been that way. Jesus had sent them out by twos, and so you've got different groups that go. He obviously liked Peter, James, and John better than the others, and so he took them on special excursions and different things. You see the separation in the garden. You see them on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so, yeah, they're one group together, right? Kind of. But some of them have special relationship with Jesus, at least privileges that you see. And then there's all the things that happened that went wrong. 
I mean, the first thing that happens that goes wrong is he calls them and he says, follow me, and they follow him, and then the next thing we read is, and then they're not. And then we find him in the Jordan, and he says, follow me, and yeah, okay, and then they're not. They're back fishing again. And then he, you know, one last time, and then they actually get at this. So they didn't always grasp this, yes, we'll follow you. They kind of went back, and then they argued about who's the greatest I don't know how you argue about who's the greatest disciple, servant, slave. You know, I'm more slavish than you are or something like that. And so you get a lot of things like that. Peter misunderstands the teaching of Jesus. And so as soon as Jesus says, I need to go and, and die and be killed and raised on the third day, he says, oh, no, you're not. And I'm like, Peter, come on. And he argues back with Jesus and he says, you're not going to do that. Lazarus has died, and Jesus says, we need to go. And the other disciples are, no, that's too close to Jerusalem. It's too dangerous. Don't you know what those people are like? And so they are balking at being able to go into a dangerous situation. Judas gripes about the money when, you know, it's used to anoint Jesus. It could have been sold and put into my pocket because that's really what was going on. It wasn't so much for what organizations do you support where you know embezzlement is going on? I mean, if you know that's happening in a church, don't you stop and say, I'm not supporting this anymore? That's going on among Jesus' disciples. Does it seem like one group together? And so then you get to the garden and they all fall asleep when he's asked them to pray and you get situations like Peter who denies that he even knows Jesus, and, but then he turns around and cries about it. They all want to run away at the cross, at the betrayal. Judas has betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver and then, and then goes and hangs himself. Thomas doesn't even believe Jesus is risen unless he can touch him. And there are so many mistakes that how can it be that they stand together? But I think that's our definition of what it means to stand together, is we're all good, we're all right, we never make mistakes. No, actually, it's we're all good, we're all right, we don't know your mistakes. That's more what it's like. And you look at all the things that had been failures there, it, it looks like, you know, how can this be one group together? It's one group that is not functioning very well because there's failure in almost every single one of them. And you start looking at that and imagining that and going, well, yeah, that's one group together. That's one messy group together. How are these guys the ones Jesus is so proud of? But the thing is they believe in one central person. They believe in Jesus Christ, and they believe he's the Messiah. They believe he's the Son of God, and so they're willing to do that, to follow him, regardless of the mistakes that each other made. It might even help if we knew the mistakes each other made, because that we don't feel so bad about our own. Have you ever been the person on the sideline? I mean, you just didn't quite make it into the game yet. The game is going on, and you're sitting waiting to go in. You ever been that person on the sideline? Yeah, we're not going to confess that. Are you kidding me? That's the worst kind of sin. It's not be the starter. We're not going to do that. But when a football team goes out on the field, how many people do they need? Eleven, right? You know how sports conscious I am, so you might need to correct this part. But you need 11, so 11 guys go out, right? They run out of the tunnel, they bust through the paper, and no, there's more than that. Why is there more than 11? You only need 11. Well, but then you need an offense too, right? So that makes another 11. So then there's 22. And actually what happens, there's probably a few more because you're going to have injuries and things like that that happen. Uh, 
And so there's a lot of times where people are sitting on the sideline waiting to go in because it's not their time to play yet. And that's what happens with us. A lot of times it's because we're not that good. And then sometimes it's, we're specialized and that's what we do. And it seems like that's kind of the situation here with the apostles because they're the specialized ones who have been trained by Jesus. They're first string. They're in the game. They're doing all this stuff. And so they're in there together. And so when it comes to Pentecost, 12 men stand up together because they're the first string. They've been trained. It's the great Pentecost and it's the sermon and Peter's going to speak, but they're all standing there together. Except for there's one guy who does not fit. He doesn't belong there at all. He's only been in the team for two weeks. You remember Judas hanged himself. And so in chapter 1, you've got the whole discussion about, well, who should we put in? We need 12. Because there has been 12, we need 12. And so they get two guys out of the 120 meeting in the upper room and say, well, all right, so we need 12. And why not take both? I mean, you have 13. And they said, no, no, no. We need 12 because Jesus chose 12. There's some speculation that maybe it's for the 12 tribes, but there's only one tribe left. Maybe it's symbolic, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles. But Jesus never picked this guy. Jesus never wanted this guy. Jesus overlooked this guy. He's not first string. He's the guy who's been on the sidelines the whole time. Because you realize the qualifications that they have for this. He has to be with us from Jesus' baptism by John all the way to ascension. Well, that's a long time. That's three and a half years. And he has to have been with us sitting on the sideline for three and a half years knowing you're not first string. Knowing you're not the main guy. And they've got two of them that are like that. Two of them that have been in that situation, why would they stay? I mean, do you keep coming out for practice when you didn't make the team? Most of us stay home. But this is important. They found the Messiah. They found the Son of God. Where else would we go? But you're not one of the twelve doesn't matter. This is the most important place on earth because God has sent his son right here, right now. Why would I walk away and go back to a job if I don't have to? And these guys have been there that whole time being able to be with him. What an incredible thing it is. You realize that maybe they were one of the 70 that got sent out rather than the 12. How easy is it to become part of the group? Well, they seem to accept him very quickly because of the work that there is to do. I mean, after all, there's a lot of work to be, get done, and we need 12 guys, and so now we've got number 12, and all right, so things are good. Did they not know about Paul and that he would, yeah, we want to slip him in there and say, oh, well, he must have been number, he doesn't even qualify he wasn't there. Jesus takes a special approach to him. And so, no, he doesn't fit at all. He's not number 12. Matthias is number 12. And he's seen the miracles. And he's watched the blind be healed. And he's watched the lame stand up. He was probably one of the 5,000 following Jesus and one of the 4,000 that was fed. And he's heard the Sermon on the Mount and he was there when the temple was cleared because he's been there the whole time. And he's accepted because they have work. Jesus said, pick 12, they need 12. And so they waited. 50 days between Passover and Pentecost and people are waiting on the sideline. It comes down to a coin toss, right? Two guys. 
or in this case, maybe a Urim and Thummim toss because not sure how they pick that, but that's where it comes to. But you, would you really turn down the chance for that outpouring of the Holy Spirit to come on you? Can you imagine what that's like for you to be on fire from the Lord and able to speak in a different language that you didn't have to study and that people can understand as you declare the mighty works of God, how amazing that must have been. It's obviously that God's accepted him too, right? And he's the fill-in. He's the guy who's come and he's part of something that is so much bigger. And then Peter goes on preaching his sermon. They're all standing there. They're all the fringe people who are there and they've, they've seen different parts and seen different things. And they got caught up by, the, by the, all the things that were going on and they were the ones who said, what? It's time for you know, some excitement. Well, maybe we ought to crucify somebody. How about Jesus? And so the crowd was all the ones who were saying, yeah, let's crucify. Yeah, let's crucify. Ooh, if he's really Jesus, he won't allow it to happen. So this is the test, right? And they killed their own Messiah. And Peter gets to that part in his sermon where he says, you crucified the Son of God. And when he finishes, he says this, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord your God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. And so those who had received his words were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Jesus is Lord, and you killed him. And the question comes back, well, what do we do? And he gives them the answer. And in verse 41, I think is interesting, as many as received his words, word because I think there's a whole lot more people standing there but not everybody listens when they're in the crowd right caught you no that's just I'm, I'm sure you're paying attention put the bulletin down <laughs> but they received his word it came into them and they said yeah I've got to change I won't want to be that guy sitting on the sideline realized, you know, I'm the one that killed the Messiah. And so they believed and they repented and they were baptized and they received the Holy Spirit. And they were forgiven and they were cleansed and they were made pure. And 3,012 stood together. And people are at it every day. And it's no longer about special players. It's no longer about the 12. And from here on, you don't really see that. I mean, you see it a few times. The 12 did this, or Peter did this, or somebody else did that. But you don't really see the reference to Jesus and his 12. You see it to the whole group. Because it's not about the special people anymore. All those people who had been on the sidelines, all those people who had faith are now part of that one group and they've come together and they all stand together. And you see them standing against Pharisees and you see them standing against people who would persecute them. And they've seen his miracles and they've heard his teaching and they might have been among the people who were fed and they had seen him crucified and now they get it. Too many times, this is our view of church. Boy, I hope something happens. And we're sitting on the sideline, right? That's what these are, a sideline? No, not at all. 
because we're going to be done in just a minute, and we all go out. We all go to the world. We all stand together. We all are part of this whole thing, and there's none one better than the other. It's time to get in the game. Faith in Jesus is what's most important. And this isn't the waiting time for somebody else. So if you have not been part of things here yet, maybe nobody's invited you. Maybe nobody said, you know, we need you to be here, but we need you to be here. We need you to be involved in this because it is not just a few key players. It is all of us that stands together. And maybe no one specifically pointed to you or gave you a place and maybe you're still struggling about Jesus, not really sure or tired of being swayed by the crowd and you want to be part of something that's real get in, jump in. We all stand together. This is Mesa Church. This is what we do. And Jesus brings people together because that's what makes all the difference because we have all been healed. And yeah, there's a whole lot of brokenness here. It's not because we've all got it together and we would judge failure. We're very much like the disciples. We've had all that failure, and this is the group of sinners that says, you know what, we all help each other. We bind up wounds together. And we've been healed from sorrow and depression and disease and loneliness, and we've seen amazing things happen. And Jesus has this invitation to come stand with us in his grace. Would you come while we stand and sing?